spoken about uh, the school of ministry. So we have some students that would like to call those to come and can testify uh, about the school of ministry. Are you here? Can you raise your hands? Hallelujah. How many people? Oh, fantastic. Oh, great. Yeah. Each day come out? Or? Yes. Can you all come up, please? Thank you. A round of applause for <laughs> Yes. So the 24th of June is our latest installment and we are doing the biblical approach to transpersonal mental health therapy. Uh, forgive me but I can't remember the name of the... Uh, is it too quiet? Let's try that. That's better. Um, they asked me to give a few words about the impact this school of ministry is having on me the last couple of months. So I'll in a few notes. And uh, the last session we had was on the 24th of June, and it was on transpersonal mental health therapy, which is quite a mouthful, quite a thoughtful. Um, and it was taught by an African professor in Florida, lives in Florida? Forgive me, I cannot remember his name. He lives in London. He lives in London. Right, okay. What was his name? Professor Esson. Esson. Professor Right, okay, so that was a bit, mm, okay, um, because uh, my background, my first degree in the mid-1980s was in psychology and sociology. I minded in psychology, and by the miracle of God's grace, I came to faith through that. Um, most people, it turns off Christianity, but I had a... Anglican upbringing, church school, and so I had sufficient background to keep me fairly, fairly well rooted. And uh, at the end of my degree, I realised well, Christianity is true after all. So I had an intellectual conversion, and then a spiritual conversion through the ministry of Reverend Norman Moss, who was on the 16th of June 1986 at 9:30 p.m. at Wimbledon Baptist Church in London. And to my astonishment, I'm going off peace now, forgive me. Um, when I first got to know Ao, I first got to know Ao because I saw the, the daily word, the, the monthly word that I was receiving from Norman Moss. I've long since lost touch with him, I haven't seen him since 1986. Ao knew him, and he put me in touch, and I saw him for the first time in nearly 37 years. Uh, was it last year was the first time. Um, anyway, so at the end of that degree, I realised Christianity was true after all, and suddenly everything fell into place. And like God opened my mind, I could understand all this stuff. Um, so I came to this course a bit concerned about was this going to be some form of syncretism, you know, where it was a mixture of Christianity and and psychology and stuff, which th those disciplines and psychiatry, they're based in the, the ideological basis is humanism, humanistic philosophy. And humanistic philosophy says that fundamentally that human nature is good. Of course, Christianity, it's not. It, we're fundamentally fallen um, and we're in need of redemption. And interestingly, Marxism takes the same approach. Human nature is fundamentally good, and a society which corrupts. But then what is society? Society is a collection of interacting individuals. It doesn't follow. It's logically, it, it, it's illogical. So, so when this uh, professor was teaching, 
I was very encouraged because he was truly taking a biblical approach to these subjects and uh, of this transpersonal mental health therapy. So it reassured me that uh, what I was studying is, is kosher. So there we are. Glad for the ministry. So the Ministry Foundation course was held at the Ridge Community Centre in Lancaster and it was compiled by IO and comprised of lectures accompanied by videos and relevant Zoom calls with people to enlighten us on different aspects of their ministry and it also gave us a feeder for the following leadership uh, course content. Now we had easy access to supporting literature and the course materials were comprehensive and of course there was time to take notes during the lectures. Um, seven lectures in all spanned across the year over a trip to Ancaster was always filled with expectation as well as a trip to the beach on the way home. So that was really great. And, and some ice cream. Um, my fellow students were people from the Ridge Church and Lancaster and others from elsewhere who had interesting ministries and personal histories. Uh, with people from diverse backgrounds, the class um, Group discussions were therefore colourful and this added to the experience. I had not studied for some time and it was a very scintillating experience. I certainly felt prepared for the essay that we were expected to submit at the end of the course and, and felt empowered by the experience. Now, um, to summarise, the course provided a good introduction to biblical understanding. It encouraged and inspired people to consider the extent to which they've developed their own relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. And it helped people to find themselves in their places of worship. It helped people to find their calling and how to stand in that. And it helped people to explore their God-given ministry. The course helped me to focus on God's calling and destiny on my own life, and I would recommend you going, of course. Thank you. I've been asked to read my essay out, so it's a thousand words long, so I'll just try and go through it. Um, so many characters in the Bible have had a oh wait, but a list of topics that we had to choose from, and I chose the significance of an encounter with Jesus. So, uh, many characters in the Bible have had encounters with Jesus, but after these encounters with Jesus have had their lives changed for the better. Moses, Zacchaeus, and Paul are great examples. The story of Moses and the burning bush in the book of Exodus is a well-known chapter of the Old Testament. It is an important moment in the Old Testament because God reveals who he is to Moses. It is the first time God has spoken to spoken his name to anyone. Located on Mount Sinai, the burning bush was on fire, but wasn't consumed by the flames. When Moses witnesses the burning bush, God speaks to Moses and tells him to leave the Israelites out of Egypt and into Canaan. The encounter that Moses had with God shows many things to us that is relevant today. The fact that Moses is 80 years of age at this point in time portrays the idea that age is no limiting factor in having encountered Jehovah. A feeling that many people can relate to is a feeling that Moses had, which was a feeling of worthiness and inadequacy. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But God, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? But despite these feelings, God still used him to have an impact on the lives of the Israelites. Moses had the divine encounter with God while he was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law. This emphasised the idea that God can have an encounter with you no matter who you are, where you're from, or whether you feel adequate or worthy enough. As long as God has a purpose for your life, and you're willing to listen and obey God. This profound encounter with Jesus, this divine vision and intervention, marked the beginning of Saul's transformation to Paul the Apostle. Paul's encounter with Jesus is a perfect example of how, by one person having an encounter, several people's lives can be changed too. 
This experience in Damascus Road was the catalyst for Saul's transformation. It marked the beginning of his journey from being a persecutor of Christians to becoming one of the most influential figures in Christianity. Paul became a tireless advocate for the teachings of Jesus Christ. His missionary journeys took him across the Roman Empire from Jerusalem to Rome. Spreading the message of Jesus, his letters or epistles, to various Christian communities from a significant part of the New Testament. To conclude, what the lives of these three characters shows us is that when you, are, when you have encountered Jesus, your life will never be, remain the same. I would only change the better. And additionally, although they all had an encounter with Jesus, their experiences were different and unique to them. Their lives also teach us why having an encounter with Jesus is so necessary. The fact that although it was them as an individual that had the encounter, the lives of others were changed too, suggesting that it is vital that we have an encounter with Jesus, not just so that we as an individual can fulfill our purpose, but others around us are inspired to step by faith and fulfill the purpose God has in their lives. Jesus. Um, but it's just really great to be stood next to my wife here when she uh, was giving her testimony and, and like you, Stephen, Jill is here. Yeah? Um, Liz, Stephen, Liz. Nice. 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 You know, I, I've been up two days now, so the brain's just working wow. not too good. But I do know this. That we got married the same year in 1997 and we both celebrated coming up seven. You just celebrated your 26th seven anniversary of And we're doing likewise. Do you know, I could stand here all day and talk about how much I love my wife. It would be easy. But unless when we drive home and when we get home, I actually put that love into practice, it's worth zilch. Could stand here too all day and talk about how much I love Jesus, how I read the Bible, how I fast, how I pray, how I do Bible studies. But unless I have an encounter with Him, as we've just heard, it amounts to nothing at all. And that's what we've been doing on our course. Having an encounter with Jesus. Not just talking about him and reading the book. But beginning that process of really becoming a disciple and becoming equipped to train other people into discipleship. We're called not to compete, but simply, we're called, we're not called to compete, but simply to learn. I'm sorry, we're not called to compete against one another. It's not a matter about me beating somebody else to the finishing line. But what we are called to do is to run our race and finish it well and encourage one another along the way. It's not a competitive race. In his book, Theme of Fellowship, I heard friend Pastor Ayo describe the church not as an organization, but as a living organism. If this is the case, then all Christians have a responsibility to take part and work towards making the church, this living organism, a vibrant, healthy, powerful entity. The only spectators must be those who have gone before that great crowd of witnesses that Paul speaks of in Hebrews 12. Otherwise, the church we will be weak and ineffectual. I think we're called to be disciples. We're called to run that race. We're called to support each other. We're called to empower one another so that we will all finish.